I guess this is my rant. So let me go and put on my sound effects. Um, um, first off, I need to remind you, you are now standing in the congregation of the mighty. This is the home of the stubborn minority. The place where your hustle builds muscle. This is Giami Journey Media. I am your host, Brother Hot Tim. And of course, you know, this is the Daily Toast. And it's a Heart of a Simba production. Where we strive, strive, strive. <laughs> to blow up your old paradigms. Let me put on this damn war horn. Let me let the world know it's rant time. It's rant time. It's rant time. You need to tune in. You need to tune in about the rant. I'm, I'm pissed. Family. Personal development has gone awry. Personal development has gone awry. They have lied to you. They have lied to you. The whole personal development scam. What, How, brother? How, it's a goddamn scam. <laughs> what do you mean, brother? How tell? Because personal development is built up on the illusion. That you are a single being. But I am a single being, brother. I tell you, I'm self-made. I have pulled myself up by my bootstraps. I, I, I survive on my own. I, 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 I have my own house. I have my own payments. I am an individual being, brother. I tell you, so I need personal development because personal development will help me get to the next level. Oh, oh, you poor sap. You have drunk the Kool-Aid and you have fallen for the trick. History shows us that History does not shine well on individuals. It is not the individual that changes history, my friend. It is the group. And often that group is represented. And let me say that. Let me say that. It's represented by one of his members. This member may be elevated to a leader. This individual may be called a king. This individual may be called a pharaoh. This individual may be called a chief. They may be called a CEO, but they are a representative of something larger and greater than themselves. So when I say personal development is a scam, all these individuals are telling you that you just need to work harder are lying to you and they just taking your money. You just need to grind harder. You just need to outwork the next man family. Let me be very clear with you. These individuals that's saying this shit to you have magnificent tribes, magnificent teams. They have developed a culture around themselves that allow them to get up on stage or to get in front of a camera and feed you bullshit, even though they might not even know it's bullshit. Because their greatness is not coming because they grind it harder. It's coming because they have developed a team or a tribe around them themselves that allows them to do the shit that they're doing here Giami journey we're not gonna lie to you we're gonna start with the group development so that you can see how it works family you look at some of these people right they start off they build their tribe they tribe empowers their family and their family empowers them to do what it is they do that is how it works. And that how is how it has worked throughout history. History does not smile well on individuals. As a matter of fact, they call them serfs and slaves and shit like that. 
Once you get into a group and you break down those group bonds, you are able to make individuals and those individuals become prey to you and your group. This is why divide and conquer works so well. If divide and conquer works, what wins? If divide and conquer loses, what wins? Huh? What's the act what's the opposite of divide? Multiply. Right? Multiply and conquer. So if divide, if if divide and conquer is what makes you lose, multiplying, which is the opposite of divide, and pulling together or building up. Multiplying and building up. I, what's a what's a better word that is the opposite of conquer? We know multiplying is there. Multiplying and developing. Multiplying and pulling together. Multiplying and ujima. Multiplying and principal activation. See, what we receive is in our history lessons. We receive the brunt, the uh, what do they call it? The brunt of the joke. We get the aftermath of the joke. We get the shit that 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 don't work. That's the funny part. And we run with it, and we make it act like it worked. Jay Z is not Jay Z because Jay Z can rhyme, or he's even the best. Jay-Z is the best because Jay-Z know how to build teams. He knows how to attract teams. LeBron. Oh, LeBron is cold. But LeBron was able to either work through a team and get to a point to understand the power. Teams. Oh, what about Malcolm X, brother? Malcolm X only rose to prominence because of the tribe that he was rock, rocking with. Other than that, he would have just been a black man talking on the streets. Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was an excellent team builder. Was an excellent tribe builder. He just said it differently. Come on, family. Martin Luther King. Oh, come on now. Do I even need to break that down for you? I you do do you see where I'm going with it? So now let me take it a little bit farther because yesterday I talked about the beginning chapter of an outlier. So guess what I guess what brother Hot Tim got for you before we get to the talk. Guess what brother Hot Tim done pulled out for you? Come on now, say it with me now. You're damn right. He done found it. Yes, he has. Right, right, right. In right, I think this is the Times or something like this. Outliers, the New York Times. Do we got a subscription to this? I don't know. I got one to the Washington Post, and I got one to the Dispatch. Do I got one to the New York Times? I don't know. I ain't going to risk it right now. So they start off by defining an outlier. Now, family, oftentimes we look at outliers. They keep you looking at the outliers. But they don't give you the full story of the outliers. That's why it's important to get books like this. Right? Something that is situated away from or classed differently from a main or related body. A statistical observation that is markedly different in value from the other sample. Now here we go. Real quick. I'm Because I want to read through this. You know what I'm saying? So bear with me. Bear with me. You know what I'm saying? Rosetto Val Fortore lies 100 miles southeast of Rome in the Apennine foothills of the Italian province of Foggia. In the style of medieval villages, the town is organized around a large central square facing the square in Palazzo Marcelle, or something like that. The Palace of Sages or Sagacy, 
family, once the great landowner of those parts. An archway to one side leads to a church, the Madonna del Carmine, Our Lady of the Mount Carmen. Narrow stone steps run up the hillside, flanked by closely clustered two-story stone houses with red tile roofs. For centuries, the Passini or Rosato worked in the marble quarries in the surrounding hills or cultivated the fields in the terrace valleys below, walking four or five miles down the mountain in the morning and then making the long journey back up the hill at night. It was a hard life. The town folks were barely literate and desperately poor and without much hope for economic betterment. Until the word reached the Rosetto at the end of the 19th century of the land of opportunity across the ocean. Guess what that land was? And guess who back? The opportunity was built on. But I won't go there. I won't. I promise. I'm going to try to stay focused. In January 1882, a group of 11 Rosetons, Rose, Rose 10 men and one boy, set sail for New York. They spent the first night in America sleeping on the floor of a tavern on Mulberry Street in Manhattan's Little Italy. Then they ventured west, ending up finding jobs in a slate quarry 90 miles west of the city in Bangor, Pennsylvania. Now here we go. The following years, 15 resistance left Italy for America and several members of the group ended up in Bangor as well, joining their compatriots in the slate quarry, those immigrants in turn sent word back to Rosetto about the promise of the new world. And soon one group of Rosettans after another packed up their bags and headed for Pennsylvania until the initial stream of immigrants became a flood. In 1894 alone, some 1,200 Rosettans applied for passports to America, leaving the entire streets of their old village abandoned. So we have a whole group of individuals, a whole tribe, that got up. And moved. They said, boom, all right. After the first group went out and they was able to go and secure something, others came and then eventually, boom, we got a flood. So all of them left. What this got to do with what you're saying, brother Hot Tim? Hold on. They began buying land on the Rocky Hillside. Remember where they came from. Connected to Bangor only by a steep, rutted wagon path. They built closely custard two-story stone houses with slate roofs on nail streets running up and down the hillside. They built a church and called it Our Lady of Mount Carmel and, the name, and named the main street on which it stood Gabaldi Avenue after the great hero of the Italian unification. In the beginning, they called their town New Italy, but they soon changed it to something that seemed more appropriate. Given that in the previous decade, almost all of them had come from the same village in Italy, they called it Rosetto. In 1896, dynamic young priest, Father Pasquale Danisco, took over Our Lady um, at Mount Carmel. Danisco set up spiritual societies and organized festivals. Hmm. Organized festivals. Set up spiritual so societies. That, that, that sound familiar to any of y'all out there? Did that sound like something... That, that's going on possibly with, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it moving. He encouraged town folks to clear the land and plant onions, beans, tomatoes, potatoes, melons, and fruit trees in the long backyards behind their houses. He gave out seeds, seeds and bulbs. The town came to life. The Rosettans began raising pigs in their backyard and growing grapes for homemade wine. Schools, a, schools, a park, a covenant. And cemetery were built. Small shops and bakeries and restaurants and bars opened along Garbaldi Avenue. More than a dozen factories sprang up, making blouses for the garment trade. Neighboring Bangor was largely Welsh and English, and the next town over was overwhelmingly German. So you had groups of individuals who came and hooked up with their tribe over here. You know, but we was going through some other shit while they was doing all this. We weren't able to compete. All right, uh, which meant, given the fracturous relationship between the English and Germans and Italians in those years, that Rosetti stayed strictly for Rosettans. If you wandered up and down the streets of Rosetto in Pennsylvania in the first few decades after 1900, you have heard only Italian spoken, and not just any Italian, but the precise Southern Fogan dialect spoken back in it Italian Rosetto. 
Rosetto, Pennsylvania was its own tiny self-sufficient world, all but unknown by the society around it, and may well have remained so, but for a man named Sturwalt Wolf. Wolf was a physician. He studied digestion and stomach and taught in the medical school, excuse me, at the University of Oklahoma. He spent summer, um, hold on, hold on. Uh, I forgot to do something, so I'm going to come back to this. I want to make sure. We're reading first chapter, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. I want to make sure y'all got that. Um, so we down here. Wolf was a physician. He studied digestion and stomach and taught in medical schools at the University of Oklahoma. He spent summers at a farm he bought in Pennsylvania. His house was not far from Rosado, but that, of course, didn't mean much since Rosado was so much in his own world that you could live one town over and never know much about it. One of the times when we were up there for the summer... This would have been in the late 1950s. I was invited to give a talk at the local medical society, Wolf said. Years later, in an interview, after the talk was over, one of the local doctors invited me to have a beer. And while we were having a drink, he said, you know, I've been practicing for 17 years. I get patients from all over, and I rarely find anyone from Rosetto under the age of 65 with heart disease. Wolf was skeptical. This was the late 1950s, years before the advent of cholesterol-lowering drugs and aggressive prevention of heart disease. Heart attacks were an epidemic in the United States. They were the leading cause of death in men under the age of 65. It was impossible to be a doctor, common sense said, and not see heart disease. But Wolf was also a man of deep curiosity. If somebody said that there were no heart attacks in Rosetto, he wanted to find out whether that was true. Wolf approached the mayor Rosetto and told him that his town represented a medical mystery. He enlisted the support of some of his students and colleagues from Oklahoma. They poured over the death certificates from residents of the town, going back as many years as they could. They analyzed physician records. They took medical histories and constructed family gene genealogies. We got busy, Wolf said. We decided to do a preliminary, pre preliminary study. We started in 1961. The mayor said, all my sisters are going to help you. He had four sisters. He said, you can have the town council room. I said, where are you going to have council meetings? He said, well, we're postponing for a while. The ladies would bring us lunch. We had little booths where we could take blood, do EKGs. We were there for four weeks. Then I talked with the authorities. They gave us the school for the summer. We invited the entire population of Rosetta to be tested. The results were astonishing. In Rosetta, virtually no one under 55 died of heart attack or show any signs of heart, heart disease. For men over 65, the death rate from heart disease in Rosetta was roughly half that of the United States as a whole. The death rate from all causes in Rosetta, in fact, was something like 30 or 35% lower than it should have been. See, you're supposed to be sick. America's supposed to make you sick. That's the only thing I can conclude. I'm just saying I'm just saying, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I just want y'all to understand what he's saying. That cannot, this ain't me, this ain't Brother Hot Tim. This is a doctor. That should not be. That should have, it. then it should have, it, you, you should have been sick. Rosetta should have been sick. They should have been falling over. But something is going on here. We got to figure out why they're not sick and start getting some shit up in here to make them sick. Hold on. We brought a friend of his, a sociologist from Oklahoma named John Brune, to help him. I hired medical students and sociology grad students as interviewers. And resort of went, we went house to house and talked to every person age 21 and over. Brown remembers this had happened more than 50 years ago. But Brown still had a sense of amazement in his voice as he remembered what they found. There was no suicide, no alcoholism, no drug addiction, and very little crime. They didn't have anyone on welfare. Then we looked at peptic ulcers. They didn't have any of those either. These people were dying of old age. That's it. That's what I told y'all yesterday. What does this have to do with greatness, Hot Tim? What does this have to do with the self-development hustle? What does this have to do with the hustle cult 
and 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 and, and, and the hustle porn that's out here, brother Hot Tim, that we're reading about. What does this have to do with me being the next rap phenom? What does this have to do with me being the next successful entrepreneur, brother Hot Tim? Give me a second. Be patient. I'm gonna bring it home. I'm bringing it home. I, if I can't do nothing else, I always bring it back home. Even though I might forget where I was going, I'm always going to bring it back home. Tell them, brother Hot Tip. Tell them again. Tell them again. Where is the war horn? We at war. Y'all don't even understand. So he brought a sociologist in. Let's keep it. Let's keep it up. He brought a sociologist in because he couldn't find what was going on medically. So they had to look at what was going on in the society. What was going on in the culture? How is it that we have a town of people that are dying of old age? They shouldn't be this healthy and be in America. This was known back in 1950s, 1960s. What in the hell is going on here? Hmm. Wolf's profession had a name for a place like Rosetta, a place that lay outside everyday experiences. Where the normal rules did not apply, Rosetta was an outlier. Two. Wolf's first thought was that Rosettans must have held on to some dietary, now listen, some dietary practices from the old world that left them healthier than other Americans. But he quickly realized that wasn't true. The Rosettans were cooking with lard instead of the much healthier olive oil they used back in Italy. Check it out. Listen. This is for real. Pizza in Italy was a thin crust with salt oil and perhaps some tomatoes, anchovies, or onions. Pizza in Pennsylvania was bread dough plus sausage, pepperoni, salami, ham, and sometimes eggs. Sweet like um, sweets like biscotti and torelli used to be reserved for Christmas and Easter. Now they were eaten all year round. When Wolf had dietitians analyze the typical resilient eating habits, he found that a whopping 41% of their calories came from fat. Nor was this a town where people got up at dawn to do yoga and run a brisk six miles. So they weren't holding on to old ways. They wasn't getting up running. They wasn't doing yoga. It wasn't one of these health. Co it wasn't a cult. It wasn't a. It wasn't a hustle porn town. The Pennsylvania residents smoked heavily, and many were struggling with obesity. If it wasn't diet and exercise, then what about genetics? The residents were a close knit group from the same region of Italy, and Wolf next thought was whether they were of a particular hardy stock that protected them from disease. So he tracked down relatives of the Rosettans who were living in other parts of the United States to see if they shared the same remarkable good health as their cousins in Pennsylvania. They didn't. What in the hell is going on? Are you interested? Do I have your attention? Attention, please. Attention, please. Do I have their attention? Do I got their attention now? Let me see. Do I got your attention? Class is in session. Class is in session. Oh, oh, we about, I'm about to bring it home. He then looked at the region where the Rosettas live. Was it possible that there was something about the living in the foothills of eastern Pennsylvania that was good for your health? The two closest towns to Rosetta were Bangor, which was just down the hill, and Nazareth, a few miles away. These were both about the same size as Risotto and populated with the same kind of hard-working European immigrants. We've combed through the both towns, medical records for men over 65, the death rate from heart disease in Nazareth and Bangor was something like three times that of Rosetto. Another dead end. Well, Ruth, Wolf slowly realized was the, the secret to Rosetto's Rosetto wasn't diet or exercise or genes or regions where Rosetto wasn't situated. It had to be Rosetto itself. As Bruin and Wolf walked around the town, they began to realize why. They looked at how Rosettans visited each other, stopping to chat with each other in Italian on the street or, or cooking for each other in their backyard. They learned 
about the extended family clans that underlay the town's social structure. They saw, they saw how many homes had three generations living under one roof and how much respect grandparents commanded. They went to Mass at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church and they saw unifying and calming effects of the church. They counted 22 separate civic organizations in a town of just under 2,000 people. They picked up on the particular egalitarian ethos of the town that discouraged the wealthy from flaunting their success and helped the unsuccessful, um, unsuccessful obscure their failures. They made everybody feel human. They didn't flaunt. They had rituals together ceremonies together they looked out for each other they were a tribe it since they came together the tribe was able to develop strong families them strong families created healthy and strong individuals in transplanting the peasant the Passan, the Passan, or uh, Passan, how you say Passan, culture of Southern Italy to the hills of Eastern Pennsylvania, Rosettans had created a powerful protective social structure capable of insulating them from the pressures of the modern world. So when they go home to, when they go to their home, they receive, all right, let's keep, all right, let's, I, I ain't going, the Rosettans were healthy because of where they were from because of the world they had created for themselves in their tiny little town in the hills. I remember going to Rosetta for the first time and you see three generational fam three generational family meals. All the bakeries, the people walking up and down the street, sitting on their porches, talking to each other, the blouse mills where the where the woman worked during the day while the men worked in the slate quarries, Broom said, it was magical. When Bruno Roof first presented their findings to the medical community, you can imagine the kind of skepticism they faced. They went to conferences where their peers were presenting long rows of data arrayed in complex charts referring to this kind of gene or that kind of physiological, physiological process. And they talked instead about the mysterious and magical benefits of people stopping to talk to each other on the street and having three generations living under one roof living a long life. The conventional wisdom said that at the time depended to great extent on who we were. That is our genes. It depended on the decisions people made, on what they chose to eat, and how much they chose to exercise, and how effectively they were treated by the medical system. No one was used to thinking about health in the terms of a place. Wolf and Braun had to convince the medical establishment to think about health and heart attacks in an entirely new way. They had to get them to realize that you couldn't understand why someone was healthy if all you did was think about their individual choices. Let's, let's expand that to success. That they had them to they had to get them to realize that you couldn't understand why someone was successful if all you did was think about their individual choices or actions in isolation. Uh, they had to get them to realize that you couldn't understand why someone was wealthy, not healthy, wealthy. If all you did was think about their individual choices or actions in isolation. They had to get them to realize that you couldn't understand why someone was happy if all you did was think about their individual choices or actions in isolation. We are not an island. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand. People are selling you shit that makes you believe that you are an island and it is all about your individual choice. But you can make all the right choices. But if your home life is fucked up and your tribe life is fucked up, guess what? You had to look beyond the individual. You had to understand what the culture 
You have to understand what culture. You have to understand what culture they were part of. Family, what culture are you part of? What's your culture? And what are the benefits of you participating in that culture? What's your tribe? And what are the benefits of your participation in it? You had to understand what culture they were part of and who their friends and families were and what town in Italy their family came from. You had to appreciate the idea of that community, the values of the world we inhabit and the people we surround ourselves with has profound effects on who we are. The value of, our, of, of an outlier was that it forced you to look a little harder and dig a little deeper than you normally would to make sense of the world. And if you did, you could learn something from the outlier. Uh, my fault. And if you did, you could learn something from the outlier that could use to help every, that that you could use to help everyone left, everyone else. And outliers, I want you to do for our understanding of success what Stuart Wolf did for our understanding of health. Did I not? Do we not cover this every day? Now we're going to get into the libation. I'm going to go and get through it real quick. But I want y'all to just think about this, family. Stop buying into the hustle porn. Understand that your individual success is connected directly to the culture that you come from. The culture that you are building. We have an opportunity right now, right here, to develop and build our culture. That feast that we just had was only uh, was, was was an example of where we could be of what we could do on a regular basis just an example with just the little support that we have what's going to happen when we got 100 members in Giami tribe what happens when we get to the limit and we have to split and we have to split 75 75 and have two tribes now What happens? What happens when we have over 300, 400, 1,000 people, just 1,000 people that understand this idea, that understand that my success, my success, my success My success is not an individual thing. My success is not an individual thing. My success is a result of the culture that I come from. My success is a result of the people that are around me. My success, my, my success is built off of the successes that came before me. I am a strong individual because I came from a strong family and my family is part of a strong tribe. And we look out and we take care of each other. They don't want you to get that. No. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. You can't get that. No, you got to stay on the hustle grind. You got to stay on the hustle wheel. You know what I'm saying? You got to go and support somebody else's tribe. See, because that's what your job is. Your job is you supporting somebody else's tribe. That's what that is. You're supporting somebody else's culture. That's what it is. I'm going to finish up this bottle of Ambrosia. I'm about to order some more honey. I'm about to brew some more Ambrosia. But family, let me tell y'all right now. So the the sea moss is in. I gotta order the bags. We're gonna be selling the the quarter pound bags. Um, we're gonna be able to sell a quarter pound for about ten dollars. We're gonna sell a quarter pound for about ten dollars, right? Doing pretty good. Doing. I mean, that's that. I think that's a good price. But also, we're going to be able to have the jars of the, we're going to call it, um, uh, I, maybe the food of the gods. I don't know. But we got that ambrosia 
or ambrosia, right? Mixed with the sea moss. Because what happens is that the sea moss come is dry. And what happens is when you put it in the water, it expands. So I said, what if we what if we soak it in um that ambrosia? So I soaked it in that ambrosia, and right now I got people testing it. So if anybody out there that's interested in testing a bottle, by all means, I'm I'm making a bottle so that they could be tested. You know what I'm saying? So you need, I mean, especially if you're a supporter or you're a member of Giami, you in the tribe, let me know. I'm going to get you your bottle for free. I'm testing it out. You take one or two tablespoons and you make you some, um, you make you some, you make you a smoothie. Or you can eat it straight up off the spoon. And it's going to present you with the health benefits. And like I said, I'm going to have the total write up of all the health benefits of everything because we already know we are discussed the health benefits of that ambrosia we got that green tea in there we got that honey we got the fermentation process we know that it's a probiotic we 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 getting it in there right but now we can we're, we're connecting it with the fiber that is coming off of that uh that sea moss and we're, we're combining it with all of those minerals that's coming with that sea moss and the health benefits of that sea moss. And we're mixing it all together and grinding it down to a nice little smooth paste that we have to keep. And, and this, I'll be able to ship around. You know why? Because it, because the ambrosia by itself is volatile. You know what I'm saying? I ship that shit. If it get too hot, we already know what's going to happen. But we ain't got to worry about that with this. We get some dry ice and we can ship it in nice little packages and we can send it out. You know, but I ain't shipping them out one at a time. That's for sure. Ship, you got paid for shipping, handling. But anyway, it is what it is, family. We're gonna lift up our glass. We toast in the creator by whatever name you choose to call that creator. We lift up our glass, we salute that creator, and guess what we say? We say the word of power around these parts, and we say, Ashe.